So again, in 2010, you can see the impact of the campaign that was launched against um, the scientific consensus on uh, climate change and its relative efficacy uh, in moving the numbers from about 35 percent, who believe it was primarily due to from natural causes, up to uh, 46 percent uh, of the population. Uh, in terms of overall uh, threats during individuals' lifetimes, uh, many uh, Americans uh, believe that it would not pose a serious threat uh, to themselves or their way of life uh, in the context of their lifetime, so 64 percent. Uh, and those numbers have been relatively uh, similar uh, towards the beginning, 69 uh, percent to 64. Um, and not all that much uh, variation. Um, and the same thing within 10 of the um, issue of, uh, um, well, 15 actually, of the issue of uh, those thinking that it would be an issue to them during their lifetime. And again, you can see a little bit of a um, downward trend there uh, in the 2010, uh, 2009, 2010 time period. Um, so, uh, Bruhl, who's a sociologist, looked at, and he's also featured on the, the Climate of Doubt video, looked at the shifting public opinion on climate change and looked at an empirical assessment of factors which influence concern over climate change in the United States. And he notes that elite cues, both from Republicans and Democrats, as well as structural economic factors such as unemployment rates, will have the largest effect on the level of public concern about climate change. That is, as individuals become more concerned with issues of climate change, the overall, or the issues of employment, for example, and the economy as a whole, they become less concerned with the issue of climate change. Uh, he notes that media coverage uh, does not, in and of itself, lead to any shifting public opinion on climate change. Rather, he sees media coverage as largely a function of elite cues and economic factors as a whole. He notes that many of the messages typically last only a month before the impact wears off. And he also further notes that uh, Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth was probably the most notable for its relative staying power within the media, uh, as well as public attention as a whole and public opinion. Interestingly enough, weather extremes have no effect on the aggregate public opinion about climate change. Although one of the set effects of global climate change has been an increase in the intensity of storms. Uh, so this is interesting that weather extremes have no impact at all. Also, going in line with This American Life, that recording that's available on Bolt, the promulgation of scientific information to the public on climate change has minimal effect. And I mean, this is really interesting because there, of, of course, is a tremendous amount of information that's being um, done uh, with climatology, climate change, the impact of things like methane release uh, from permafrost, for example, uh, increasing intensification, um, changing of ocean currents. Um, so tremendous amount in terms of hydrology, geology, climatology, and how these things are intersecting with one another. But this again shows the relative disconnect between the work of scientists as well as the lay public and, and also um, as well um, the disconnect between the work of scientists and politicians as a whole um, too. Now, uh, we would be wrong to assume that uh, conflicts over whether or not climate change is actually occurring are merely a product of our own time period. Enfield and Nash in their 2002 piece, Missionaries and Morals, Climatic Discourse in 19th Century Central South Southern Africa. Uh, in this piece, this is a historical piece which looks at climatic discourse in the Kalahari. And it is drawn from a number of written accounts, so it's a historical piece that looks at the written accounts of British missionaries and what they left behind uh, while they were based in mission state stations within and around the Kalahari Desert region, 
uh, this goes back to um, the 19th century. They note uh, a couple of key things uh, within uh, this article. Uh, first, conceptualizations of climatic, climatic variability in the region, and second, responses to that climatic, climatic variability in the region. First, uh, in terms of conceptualizations, missionaries positioned climatic variability within a moral economic framework. Uh, and illustrate their attitude towards uh, local drought myths and rainmaking superstitions. Uh, um, so this is a very judgmental um, um, type of statement here. Uh, missionaries appear to have linked drought to moral degradation. That is, the local inhabitants were, were essentially being punished for um, their traditional um, attitudes, their traditional practices uh, concerning myths uh, and rainmaking as a whole. This is, uh, they were not uh, seen as, uh, uh, as moral people and hence were being punished. Local populations in turn had a different account of what was happening in the environment or what Enfield and Nash refer to loosely as their environmental religion or climatic philosophy that located the arrival of the European within a framework of climatic change. And so it's when the Europeans first arrive into the Kalahari that you start to see drought become present uh, in the Kalahari. Interestingly enough, although both the missionaries as well as the local populations note that there has been a climatic shift since the arrival of the missionaries for very different reasons. The data from the region that was suggest that uh, that was collected suggests in fact that there was no climatic variability or within the region any more than had existed previously within the region. Uh, the authors also note the responses to climatic variability in the region with the introduction of irrigation technology to the region by the missionaries. The actual construction of the irrigation projects provided a forum for cultural interaction between local populations as well as the missionaries. And irrigation was considered not only a practical response to the climatic conditions in the region, and a means by which missionaries could assert some ideological control over this environment. But for the missionaries, it was also looked at as a route towards the moral redemption of not only local populations, but the environment as a whole. So we can see here the, the idea of conflict over uh, climatic change has been argued about. There's been a moral compass that's been associated with this. And we can see some of these same arguments that are playing out in the context of climate of doubt in terms of individuals who are noting the potential long-term ramifications for human survival of not taking action, as well as the potential detrimental economic actions or economic ramifications of taking action uh, on climate change uh, before, quote-unquote, all the science is in. Cruikshank and her work uh, glaciers and Climate Change, Perspectives from Oral Tradition, examines oral histories and oral traditions as a means to um, look at information on climate. And indeed, indigenous peoples live in close proximity to the environments. Uh, they uh, have accessed uh, traditional subsistence resources for millennia, and they are very familiar uh, with um, variations in local weather patterns, uh, as well as explanations for uh, with, that are embedded within their oral histories for things like animal behaviors, um, showing proper respect, as well as hunting techniques as a whole. Um, Cruikshank addresses the incorporation of local knowledge into scientific research and um, the way in which oral tradition contributes to another variety of historical understanding. Within the context of his academic debates, whether in science or in history, too often uh, these debates uh, evaluate local expertise as data or evidence rather than as knowledge or theory that might contribute different perspectives to academic questions. So this fundamentally becomes an issue of power in the context of knowledge production. Whose knowledge is meant to serve 
uh, and others. Uh, within which framework uh, is the overall knowledge going to be integrated? And what Cruikshank is essentially arguing for here is that perhaps scientists um, using uh, objectivity and um, science that is not necessarily place-based uh, should uh, potentially consider the ramifications of utilizing uh, indigenous traditional ecological knowledge merely as a resource to further their own scientific agendas. I want to transition a little bit here to a discussion of Shishmar of Alaska. Uh, this is featured uh, in the video on uh, Shishmar Ref, and I encourage particularly watching the latter half of the video. Uh, the first half primarily talks about uh, coastal erosion uh, in Shishmar Ref, the issues of relocation, um, moving many of the houses from one side of the village to the other, uh, to the other shoreline, but realizing that erosion is, coastal erosion is happening at a, such a rapid pace here that eventually the village is going to have to be moved. Uh, and there's lots of discussion about where that should be moved, uh, whether it should be moved uh, to the mainland. And if it is not moved to the mainland, then what are the potential ramifications for cultural continuity? There's a lot of discussion about the ramifications for cultural continuity nonetheless as individuals move uh, from their historic subsistence environments to 10 to 12 miles from uh, these environments and then the potential for um, subsistence camps that would occur uh, during the summer months when individuals move out and pursue subsistence resources that they have uh, currently access to uh, in Shishma Ref itself. Um, so what this um, film points to is the connections between traditional ecological knowledge and climate change. Uh, and that traditional ecological knowledge, as Cruikshank mentions as well, is place-based. Uh, and that the local ecology becomes incredibly important and becomes co-determinative of the cultural knowledge and accessing uh, those material resources in the environment. Uh, so again, the film uh, Losing Ground, Shishma uh, Ref Alaska, talks about some of these issues, particularly the last 10 minutes are informative regarding issues of uh, traditional ecological knowledge, climate change, and subsistence. Uh, in 2008, Smith uh, produced an article of Ice and Men for Cultural Survival. Uh, Cultural Survival Quarterly. It's published by Cultural Survival, uh, which is a nonprofit organization which was started by anthropologists um, in um, um, for for the purposes of um, allowing for and advocating for the rights of indigenous peoples towards sovereignty and self determination. So Smith um, enters into the field in Barrow, Alaska. And he considers the impact of the Endangered Species Act in terms of listing the polar bear for residents of Barrow. And there's been a lot of discussion about polar bears, uh, these ice flows breaking off, um, the uh, more ice-free areas that would require these bears to swim longer and longer distances, uh, some distances where they wouldn't be able to uh, cover uh, the bears then potentially having to move inland uh, or essentially uh, becoming extinct, dying out. Um, and so, as in many contexts in Alaska, you have meetings between official government representatives and local indigenous people regarding things like animal behavior. Um, and Smith talks about this, and he talks about how the science which was brought by the fish and wildlife rep uh, representatives there was used, it, it was brought with the intent of justifying the listing of polar bears as threatened. And this looked really good on paper, but uh, it was incomplete even to other scientists, and it completely ignored in Inupiat traditional knowledge. Um, and this is an outtake here from Smith's piece. Uh, listing the polar bear does not address the problem, Whaling Captain Charlie Brower said. The problem pointed out in your own study is shrinking sea ice, which is cars caused by carbon dioxide emissions. The Inupiat said the listing of the polar bear as threatened does nothing to address sea ice retreat. It is a measure uh, meant to make people the lower 48 feel as though they're saving the polar bear when in fact they're doing nothing at all. Uh, so this, you know, I think what 
of Charlie Brower uh, is trying to say here essentially.